think it's safe to say Canada's best magic player. I know Sean McLaren can really play too. But I think right That's, now maybe Hayne. I, I I feel like it's kind of one of those one and one A debates. Yeah. You know, both Pro Tour champions. And if Hayne didn't know what he's up against, he clearly knows now. He's seen Urza's Tower and an Expedition map. Hayne's got a good one mana artifact too. He's got a copy of Amulet of Vigor off of a gemstone mine. His round number five is underway here. See if Majors has another Tron piece to have turn three Tron. Certainly going to need it in this matchup. You've got to get moving and grooving against Amulet Bloom. I know that Hayne is on a mulligan at five, but he can still go crazy. Oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I never like the debates about who's better between these two extremely accomplished players because sure. I feel like the debate inevitably becomes a denigration of someone's accomplishments. That's where you create the separation, and uh, I think both Alexander and Sean are, are incredible Pro Tour champions, and... I'm happy kind of just leaving it at that. We got ourselves an anxious stirrings here for Mr. Hayne. Both Hayne and McLaren here this weekend, by the way. Both of them 4-0 and so far at Grand Prix Charlotte. And if you know McLaren, you have to assume a Jeskai strategy. For Hayne, he's had some success with this strategy. Again, I mentioned he top eight at Grand Prix Vancouver with Amulet Bloom a little bit earlier. Stirrings unresolving. Selects a copy of Amulet of Vigor. There's a semi growth chamber. You'll get an Amulet trigger, which will untap that. And now here's another copy of Amulet. So it seems like Haney might be poised to go absolutely nuts here in a minute. I mean, a, a bounce land next turn, and that's just a whole lot of mana. Yeah. And Michael's draw a little on the slow side here, not threatening to turn three Tron. Michael may have to consider, perhaps with this expedition map, searching for a little ghost quarter action. He does have one in his main deck. Now he could search for another Tron piece, of course, but... You might want to say, you know what, Hayne, you did mulligan to five. Perhaps I'll fire away and take care of this Simic Growth Chamber. I think it's a reasonable play at this spot. Alexander with one forest to go get. So with another bounce land, Alexander's still c capable of going crazy. Major's going to search up the Urza's mine. Maybe he's hoping for the best. It's always scary to play against actually both of these decks because they always just feel like, oh, they're one turn or one card away from going absolutely crazy. Well, uh, the difference is that Tron, it's always kind of face up what they're capable of. Sure. They make all land drop a turn. You know when they're threatening to assemble Tron or not, and you know what they can do once they assemble Tron. Amulet, there's a lot more uncertainty about what might be happening the following turn. Major's going to take a draw here. We know he's got Urza's Mine in his hand. Got a couple of Chromatics in hand, too. It looks like two stars and one Sphere from Michael. He'll play in Urza's mind. There's a copy of Expedition Map. So Tron will be online next turn if he'd like for it to be. That's his choice on what land he wants to search up. His hand will take a draw step. Assuming there is a next turn. <laughs> that is a, an assumption that, yikes. Mm. Uh, Simic Growth Chamber is going to get a couple of triggers thanks to the two amulets, and now it's going to return itself. And there's a hive mind. And I think we might have a pack here in just a second. There is a Summoner's Pact. Which, you know, the nice thing about Alexander, if you've never met him before, he's very nice. He's very giving. Mm -hmm. He's a very nice guy. So as a result, he gets Summoner's Pact, and so does Michael. Yeah, so generous. I think sportsmanship is very important in Magic, and being able to give things to other people who are less fortunate. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're seeing happen here. Now, Michael is conceding the game. I guess he doesn't want the Summoner's Pact. Right, there's a long history of symmetrical cards being good in Magic and the opponent not appreciating the symmetry of it. The Wrath of God. Yep. Winter Orb. Also true. Armageddon. Yep. Stasis. Moat. The Abyss. Nether Void. I mean, it's just so many, and the other person doesn't appreciate the gift that's being given. Alexander Haynes going to win the game mm -hmm. one here over Michael Majors. Amulet Bloom up a game here over Green Red Tron. And it's strange to say that Michael was a little too slow Stri out of the gate. Strip mine. More symmetry. <laughs> True. More, more gift giving that's just not appreciated from the other side of the table. I lose the land. You lose, lose the, the land. land. I don't see a problem with this. We're going to take a look at the sideboards here. We will start with Mr. Majors and how he can turn things around. Now, we saw at the Season 2 Invitational on Trazi when he won that tournament, he had multiple copies of Crucible of Worlds as well as Ghost Quarter. For Mr. Majors, he's got a Cavern of Souls here. He also has four copies of Nature's Claims, three Rending Volleys, two Torpor Orbs, two Thragtus, two Crucible Worlds, and a Ghost Quarter. Only starting one Ghost Quarter this weekend. He's got the other one on board in along with the Crucible Package and then two Torpor Orbs, though those would not have helped in that game. Yeah, Torpor Orb is pretty solid against Primeval Titan, obviously, in the, in the unlikely event, Alexander 
Alexander goes to threats like Hornet Queen, they're solid there. I think he's going to want the four copies of Nature's Claim. He has to fight over Amulet. And of course, we want the extra copy of Ghost Quarters to pair with the Crucible Worlds. I think that's Michael's best game plan. Crucible alongside Ghost Quarter gives him some game uh, in spite of how bad game one is for him. What does Mr. Hain have on his side? Three copies of Leyline of Sanctity, a Hornet Queen, two copies of Pyroclasm, two copies of Seal, Seal Primordium, a Nature's Claim, a Ghost Quarter, three copies of Thrag Tusk, a Forest and a Cavern of Souls. Uh, I think that he may want the other copy of Forest if he's anticipating the Ghost Quarter package coming in uh, uh, on Michael's side of the table. I think he's okay with some artifact destruction in this matchup as well. Tron plays uh, a variety of expedition maps and Crucible Worlds and so forth. So some mixture of Seal Primordium Nature's Claim seem good to me here as well. I think that Alexander's primary game plan of just trying to combo out with Primeval Titan or High Mind is very strong in this matchup. And I think threats like Thrag Tusk and Hornet Queen are pretty anemic. Those are cards that Tron can beat if they're allowed to do its thing. So I think Alexander should still maintain the core strategy of the deck, but just bring in a little bit of enchantment removal and artifact removal and the extra forest so he has a little more durability against Ghost Quarter. If ever you were curious the power level of Amulet Bloom, we just saw Alexander Hayne mulling into five on the draw against Tron. Tron was able to accomplish Tron on turn four. Didn't even get the opportunity to do that. No, I mean, uh, the, this deck is so explosive. The Amulet deck is so explosive, uncontested. That was a mulligan to five. Yeah, this deck doesn't mess around. No, it is very powerful when it draws Amulet. It does get some draws where it doesn't have Amulet or Summer Bloom, and it's very susceptible to just being too slow or by getting hit with a discard spell or a single counter spell or so forth. But when you have one of those two cards and a reasonable hand, you're going to power through decks like Tron pretty easily. Now, what I've always found interesting about a deck like Amulet Bloom is you and I can have this conversation, ask and viewers at home, and even people in this tournament among these 3,000 players, of what is the most powerful deck in the format? I think most people would say it was Amulet Bloom. But what kind of makes people not want to play the deck is that it's just like, well, it's kind of hard. And, you know, there are hate cards and all of this stuff. And at, at the end of the day, the players who actually have taken the time, like Alexander Hain, like Chris Van Meter, and a bevy of other people, Justin Cohen, Sam Black, who have felt so strong about this deck being the best deck in the format, if you've taken the time to learn the lines of playing how to beat the hate cards, you feel kind of invincible. And we've seen decks like that over the course of Magic's history where it's, you know, it might look a little challenging on the surface. Maybe it is. Maybe it even is. Excuse me, challenging to play. But once you figure it out, it's worth it. it, it the what's the most powerful deck is always a weird conversation to me because. At the end of the match, there's a winner and there's a loser, and the, the labels of things like powerful don't necessarily describe who won and lost the game. Sure. If we're talking about raw power in terms of speed, I think Goryeo's Vengeance is the most powerful deck in the format, but it's certainly not what I would recommend someone playing in a, in a tournament. I think Amulet Bloom is very, very fast, very explosive. It's clearly a tier one deck, and uh, if you want to use some, one, some of the more kind of abstract definitions of powerful, it definitely qualifies as that as well. You're going to beat a reasonable amount of disruption, and some decks are just not going to be able to interact with you in a meaningful way. Yeah, I find it interesting where we just have decks that take place in Magic. I, I, I'm really kind of thinking about now Mirrodin Block back in 2004, where Affinity was clearly the best deck. Yeah. And many people, myself included, spent time on decks like Green, Red, All Artifact Hate, or... That's the deck I played at the Block Pro Tour. Could have been playing with Skull Clamp and Aether Vial. And you chose Oxidize. I chose Glissa Sunseeker. Okay. Molder Slug. Very nice. Five mana for yeah, six. Really good. Wait. They sacrifice an artifact every, every turn. turn. Every turn they do. I believe it was Mirror Retriever that got sacrificed a good percentage of the time. Interesting. Very nice. Did, you take, a, did you take one because they had a Disciple in play? It too? was a humiliating tournament. <laughs> it was a truly... You know what matchup I was really good in? The Mirror. Because I had Troll Acetic. Nice. Troll it was really good against you other decks. You came prepped for the Mirror. That's smart. Incidentally, but but we've seen decks like Affinity where it's like, okay, this is clear cut the best deck, and other players saying, well, you know, I think I can beat it with other strategies, or this might be a little bit too complicated Listen, for me to do. Winning deck at that Pro Tour, mono red, barb lightning was in the deck. Yeah, I believe it was big red at that tournament, right? Yeah. Furnace dragon red. Yep. Where are the chips? That's as they say. That's true. Arc slugger. Are you familiar? Right. I do find it just kind of interesting as a whole how the community looks at what decks to play. And the Samuel Bloom, the Samuel Bloom deck is nowhere near 2004 Finney. No, not course. even close. Most people who are listening and watching the broadcast right now have no idea what we're even talking about because that deck is so long ago. The thing is, given what R and D has stated the goals of the format to be, and given how challenging it is to interact with the deck sometimes, 
they might feel like even setting aside the power level is not something they really want in the format. And Ursa's mine into a Chromatic Star is where Matrix will start things. Both players keeping seven cards. If you've not done your magic history, you should definitely take a look at those old Affinity Necklace, because I tell you what, in a different game then, my friends. As you mentioned, Skull Clamp. <laughs> play four of those. Was legal. He, you got to play four copies of that card. Here's a Gemstone Mine. Is it time for an Amulet? It's going to be an Ancient Stirrings here for Hain. Now in the post-board games, when Michael has access to some amount of artifact removal at instant speed, Alexander is going to be much more inclined to wait and to play his amulet inside of a turn where he can do something really explosive with it. He's not going to play amulet as part of a setup turn if he can avoid it. Let's see what Majors has for his second turn. Looks like he's going to deploy a ghost quarter and now a copy of Torpor Orb. So he has found a hand with a decent amount of hate in it. Yeah, probably going to be a little bit on the slower side as a result of this, but this is some pretty valuable interaction. One of the nice things about Tron in this particular matchup, too, if your lands line up accordingly, you don't die on turn three, you actually have the ability to pay for packs. Yep. Now, double packs, most decks can't actually beat that, but a single pack, because of the chromatic stars and chromatic spheres, you actually have this weird roundabout way to actually be able to pay for those. Hain, going to remove a counter from the gemstone mine. We'll see what's next here for Alexander. It'll be another copy of Ancient Stirrings. So he'll take a look at five cards. Pro, St Pro Tour Avacyn Restore Champion with Miracles. Yep. Got to a rough start of that tournament. I believe started that tournament one in three and battled his way all the way back to hoist the trophy. I know that we talked a lot about, you know, BBD saying eighth and ninth edition need to go. You want to know what sex got a lot of odd ducks that happen to be really powerful in a large card pool? Future site. Yeah. The PAX, Teleria West. A lot of interactions with Teleria West. Tarmogoyf? Tarmogoyf is actually kind of a, it is a, a weird design, but it's actually a fundamentally a normal magic card. It's a lot of odd ducks in Future Sight. Even mind sensors in there. You, yeah. You can comb weird through that up. set and find some, some pretty strange stuff. A creature with negative power. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's Spinal Parasite. Uh, Char Rumbler. Uh, <laughs> I think we should just have that queued up on the top yeah. of your brain. A lot of weirdos. Well, we play a game sometimes that's really fun that's just called Search for a Random Future Sight Car. Okay, actually, but... <laughs> I actually forgot about this card. Yeah. Future Sight yes. has a lot of those moments. If you want to have fun, you, do, you go to Gatherer and just search for a random Future Sight card, and it's really, really fun. Sure. Double strike because why not? The FAQ entry for this card is seriously something like, this is not a mistake. This card literally has negative power. Yeah. <laughs> and there's this tower here for Michael. <laughs> and perhaps the Sylvan Scrying as well. Okay, so this is a beautiful turn for Michael. He sacrificed the star for a green mana. Looks like he drew into a Tron Priest and there's his tower. Now he can scry for the other Tron Priest or a Ghost Quarter, depending on how he's feeling. But he's going to get himself what looks like an Urza's Power Plant. So there that is. And so now he's got Tron online next turn. Ghost Quarter for protection against that Senate Growth Chamber, if you'd like to fire it off right now, and Torpor Orb to beat Primeval Titan. Yeah, this is a great setup this, here. This is a great start. And he could, he could die next turn. So that's the thing that <laughs> he could still just, still He could still turn. just die next turn. He's going to snap him off. Love the strip mine here. Symmetrical. Symmetrical. Michael being very generous. Not clear if Alexander appreciates that or not. We'll he does. Out. He'll take a forest here. One nice guy. Both players, great sportsmanship, very giving, mm -hmm. both sides of the table. So if Hayne has something ludicrous, like an amulet into play a bounce land, cast Summer Bloom, have a bunch of fun, which this deck is certainly capable of if you ever watched it in action before. We'll see what happens here for Hayne. Because but right feels, now, he's under the gun. It feels like this is the kind of game where, where Alexander has to have Summer Bloom to get much of anything going. Yeah. Especially if Michael finds Crucible Worlds. Then it becomes a really bad spot. There's a gemstone mine. Here is Summer Bloom. All right, so Michael might die this turn. Well, no amulet involved. So I think he's just oh, fine. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is an honest-ish turn. This is just a development turn of generating you know, three mana worth of extra lands that stay around. Cynic Growth Chamber is land number one. Boros Garrison is land number two. Gemstone Mind Reset is land number three. And now if you are Mr. Majors, it'd be a great time to have that Tron piece plus Karn. We know he's got part one in Ursa's Power Plant. Does he have part number two is the question. Even a one of the, man, the colored mana producing artifacts would give him a lot of protection 
against Hive Mind. He doesn't want to come into this turn with nothing but colorless mana available and not having disrupted Alexander's board. Toronto's online. Here's a copy of Expedition Map. And there's a chromatic piece. Let's see if Michael wants to cash in this chromatic piece or not. Because this chromatic piece is not protection against blue pact or green pact. Correct. Here's Oblivion Stone. And now Michael is hoping that is Primeval Titan. Yep. That's pretty much all that means. Because Hive Mind plus a pact is going to be lights out. So we'll see what majors he can put together in this next turn, assuming he gets a next turn. For now, we're on Haynes' turn, and he'll analyze his hand, see how he wants to move forward. He's got five mana at this point. We know he's got another land in his hand because he got a force from that Ghost Quarter. It's in the grip right now. So six mana, which is one of the flashpoints for this deck, he can work his way towards. So it looks like he's going to maybe transmit to Tulare West here, and he will. So he gets to search for something that's zero mana. It could be a land. It could be an Engineered Explosives can be one of the Pact effects. Summoners, Slaughter, or Pact Navigation. It looks like he's going to go with Pact of Negation. Hain looking maybe for a little protection against a big spell like Karn Liberated right now. Yeah, and he can kind of do this on a style here as Alexander is capable of paying for his blue pack should that come up. There is Gemstone Mine from Hain. He'll pass the turn back. Majors, looks like he's going to sacrifice that expedition map. See if he wants to go ghost quarter hunting here or not. Typically in these Ambulant Bloom decks, you only find one basic forest. Hain have more basics this weekend? He has one forest and then one in the sideboard, which I assume was brought in. I believe it's actually in his hand right now. And he already searched for the... Or excuse me, got picked up. So yep. he, he I, I would assume that he would have the second forest in for this matchup. I have to imagine this for Ghost Quarter situations. Well, Ghost Quarter is the weapon of choice there for Majors off the Expedition map. We'll see what his draw step yields here in just a moment. Didn't get a great look at it. It looked like it may have been a copy of Relic of Progenitus. There is Relic. With the mana floating, he'll sacrifice that, so it's simply going to cantrip or exile all the graveyards and allow Major to draw a card, which is a copy of Sylvan Scrying, which he can cast off of. That Chromatic Sphere. Again, he hasn't played land just yet, but he will play a Ghost Court and go after the Simic Growth Chamber. Hain has come prepared with the forest from the sideboard. Yep. He'll search that up. And most players only playing one basic in their deck, but Haynes sideboarding in a second one. Good deck building there from Alexander. And I'm curious to know if this was kind of in some ways as a result of last weekend's tournament. I feel like it almost Wanting has to be. a little extra padding for Crucible plus Ghost Quarter. We're going to head back Haynes' way. Haynes will take a draw. We know he's got basic force in hand yet again. The rest of the hand, a bit of a mystery here at this point. Remember, a lot of Haynes powerful proactive plays do not work right now because of the Torpor Orb. Yeah. Hive Mind's the big one that does work. Yeah. Looks like Majors is going to put a fate counter onto his Torpor Orb. Don't get to see this much 
from Oblivion Stone. Do we have actually specific fate counters, or are we just tracking this with dice? I believe we'll be doing this with just dice. Much to your disappointment, I'm sure. Usually we're pretty prepared with the tokens we bring. Having no fate counters, whatever that would be. I'm gonna sacrifice the star, excuse me, the sphere for a green mana. Back here's an anxious stirring. So they call this mana floating. Take a look at the top five, a forest, a car, an expedition map. The Grove of the Burn Willows and card number five. Don't get a great look at there for majors. Hard to pass up on Karn Liberated, though. That's exactly what majors will take. Again, a colorless mana floating at this point from the Urza's power plant. More stone rains, please and thank you. That'd be your favorite. Mm hmm. Now, Michael is not quite ready for the big play just yet because Alexander is still with access to patch negation and the ability to pay for it. And it might be to the point here if you're majors where you just say, okay, I have to get through this pact anyway, so I'm just going to cast my thing, see what happens. He's going to play Sphere off the mana that was floating. Now here is Karn. And I, I, I imagine this will get pacted, but, yeah. you know, we'll see what Hayne wants to do here in this situation. This is Major's real first test card of here's my thing. And it's like, okay, counter your thing, but also this, this will take up your entire turn. It's not like this card is, this card is not bad, even though it got countered. No, it's perfectly fine. For me, the way I look at situations like that is, I have to get this, I have to get past this point in the game anyway. Yep. So here's my thing, counter my thing, and then tap your five mana, or you lose the game. So that's fine. Here's your Gruel Turf. Pick up a Gemstone Mine to reset it. Now if Matrix has a follow-up, that's where life gets really good, is he drew a copy of Emrakul, which is... A follow-up of sorts. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, somewhere down the line. Yeah, he'll have we'll to, get to that. have to work his way towards that a little bit. Going to cash in the sphere here for, I imagine, a green mana. No reason to add for a red. And we found a Crucible of Worlds. There we go. That's what Mr. Majors was looking for. Now we're cooking with gas. Now it's Stone Rain City. Your invitational card, huh? Yeah. A town I wish I was an honorary mayor of. <laughs> Here's Crucible of Worlds. Get him. <laughs> the getting is going to occur, don't you worry. Oh, yeah. Now, this is really what Ali Antrasi brought to the table the Season 2 Invitation on his sideboard to give him a leg up in the Amulet Mirror as well as the Tr against Tron decks. Crucible plus Ghost Quarter, and Hain has both Forest in play, so this is straight up Strip Mine at this point. Major's going to cast a Sylvan Scrying. I wouldn't be surprised to see an Urza's Tower here, the weapon of choice, because he wants to build towards Emrakul, but we're going to see a lot of Ghost Quarter activations now. Yep. I suppose there's an argument for getting Eye of Ugin if Worm Coils are still in his deck, because he can sort of do that slowly while Crucibling every turn, but I also don't mind getting the Tower here and just, let's, let's go to 15, yeah. Hain is under some real pressure now. But oddly enough, Hain can still win this game. Primeval Titan's going to be poor, but Hain can still win this game. He's got five men out there, and one of them is blue. We know there's a gemstone mine in hand, so if he plays a gemstone mine and into a hive mine and a pact, it's over. But he's got to get to it pretty soon. Oh, he's got to do it all like this turn. Yeah, Summer Blooms, as long as he can cast Summer Bloom and hold some lands in his hand, there's always hope that that couldn't get him you know, through the back door, but it, he's running out of time. There's a Vesuva. He's going to copy a Gemstone Mine, pass that turn back. Majors will take a draw. Picked up a copy of Grove of the Burn Willows. You see him reaching for the graveyard. Yeah. Yep, going to look for a Keep ghost corner. coming. Womp. Yep, going to go after Boros Garrison. Take that down. Magic can be a complicated game. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, too. I think we're going to see Majors keep it pretty straightforward of kill your land every turn. There's a gemstone mine. Three counters on that land. Hain looks to have a copy of Simeon's Spirit Guide. Uh-oh. Here's Hive Mine. Hain is not going to give up on this game. Does he have a pack to cast? It appears that mm. he does in Summoner's Pack. And even though Majors was able to play a Torpor Orb to find Crucible Worlds in Ghost Quarter, the power of Amulet Bloom yet again on display as Alexander Hain able to win this match here over Michael Majors two games to zero. 
Amulet Bloom moves on to 5-0 and in the hands of one of the very best players in the room here in Alexander Haynes. That, that's got to be a, a tough game for Michael because it, that had all the look of my sideboard pieces are all coming to bear. They all feel very relevant. This Torp Orb shutting down Primeval Titan. I've got Crucible 